Welcome back to another special podcast from Psych Cosmos. Hello. Hello. Uh, t- in today's episode, it's actually pretty special, um, pretty significant. Uh, at the recording of this podcast, it is June 27th, 2020. So that means that it's officially been one year since we posted our most popular video uh, titled Never Give Up. Um, Otherwise so- known as... That's right. In this episode, we're going to discuss a lot of uh, very deep things, um, very, very deep things, a lot of very spiritual, scientific-based um, concepts, theories, um, you know, facts, a lot, of, a lot of source material, a lot of information. So we want to go, we want to go deep, um, but we're not going to bog you down mm. necessarily within a, a stupid amount of nitty-gritty details. Right. So we're going to more so go through some, some larger deep topics mm-hmm. um, and then discuss some details about them uh, maybe how we came across this knowledge maybe point you in the direction if you want to look into these yourself and uh, at the end of it w- why does this all matter like the the, the right. so what of this so so what right we're gonna that's that's the real focus of of this video i think we're also going to be drinking um i'm not going to tell you what we're drinking but um cheers we, cheers to that and with that why don't we start the podcast So it's been officially one year since we posted the Never Give Up video. And the reason that we made it wasn't necessarily just to get views. Um, I originally, no, I originally posted um, a video called Never Give Up Your Way on my secondary channel called Metal Gear Fro. Uh, And it got, you know, I I made the video in college. And the reason I did it was just because of a friend of mine um you know showed me a couple different videos and song clips and i was like okay well i'll just put it together and make a stupid video because i enjoyed doing it i didn't realize that it was going to get almost three million views in a couple of years and it's you know it was going to be flooded with comments from people saying that it helped them not kill themselves uh so it really warmed my heart to see that and then as i went on my own personal you know journey through life after college you know, working a couple really good jobs um having you know a few relationships here and there making a lot of friends and networking and uh just kind of grounding myself as an adult uh i started uncovering uh, with the help of rich of course and all the rest of the members of team psychosmos i started uncovering um we all started uncovering truths about the world the government the universe, the human body, things of that nature. And it was almost as if these things were given to us. Um, It was like wisdom was kind of dropped from the heavens, I guess you could say. At least that's the way we kind of feel. So the whole purpose of us having it wasn't to hoard it, it was to share it. One of those things um, that we learned was, and it will tie into the entirety of this conversation, I think, is emotion and frequency. Uh, and how they relate. And what I mean by that is, um, as we'll, as we'll kind of go throughout this podcast, you'll learn a lot of different things that you might not have heard, things that you should definitely do research on your own time, but one of which is that positive emotion, motivation, for example, uh, is one of the most powerful things on the face of this earth because motivating people to do the right thing and getting people to accept more positive emotions rather than negative emotions, which is kind of what we're seeing right now going on in the world, that is a big deal. Invoking the inner human spirit of others has always been, throughout history, a very, very large aspect of living on planet Earth. Um, religion is, is kind of a great example that I could use for that. Invoking um, some for, form of emotion within the masses, uh, even if it's fear, which is what we're seeing right now with coronavirus and a lot of other political ploys. Um, but I wanted to create something that was going to motivate others. So we decided to recreate the Never Give Up, uh, and it's been a year, and it's you know over 175,000 people have seen it. I can't even fathom a room filled with that many people. That's bigger than any stadium I've ever been in that can hold that capacity of people. I would people. never go near that big of a crowd of people. It's, it's no a, offense. I love you all, but I don't do crowds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rich is more of an introvert than I am, but even still, it's it, going beyond that. That's, a, that's a, a lot of people. And not to mention the fact that we have other videos that have over tens of thousands of views. So more or less, this podcast is more of a thank you. Um, it's more of an homage to you, the, the listener, 
Um, we did do a podcast a few days ago. Uh, this one might come out before that one or after that one, depends. But this one is extremely important in understanding history uh, and more about what it means to be human. And, and about what's going on in the world. And what's going on in the world as well. Um, because if you only look at the surface level of information, then nothing that's going on in this world and nothing that has, has gone on in this world makes much sense at all. Right, right. And you have to understand from the perspective of what we study here at Psychosmos, the most powerful, the most rich, the most elite individuals, families, and groups of people are studying these things. And have been throughout and history. For, and don't let, them, don't let them kid you otherwise. Right, for thousands of years. And it's been quoted from multi-billionaires, um, the way that they kind of perceive life on this planet and they perceive their own theology. Um, why is it that billionaires don't go to church to worship Jesus Christ? Why don't they go to temple? Uh, why, why don't they go to mosque? You know, you, th these are questions that I had years ago. I wanted to know why was it that the, the mega wealthy who supposedly have the majority of power, who should probably have most of the answers, especially from, you know, and I'm using air quotes here, but the peons of society, which would be the average person, which would be the 99%, why is it that they have access to all of this incredible information and power compared to the rest of us? Well, it, it has to come down to a belief structure, whether it's habitual or spiritual, whether it's physical or, you know, metaphysical. Or both. Or both. Um, there had to be some kind of secret to success. And there are. Like a real secret. We don't mean yeah. the, the book that you have to spend $50 to and he basically just tells you... Uh, Do work, what work, you love. Work hard, make friends, and try. Because yeah. of, of course everybody knows that. And it's not to say that those things aren't effective and true. Right, they it's are. it's just, if you're going to go out of your way to say that you have a special hidden secret and that's all you got kind of goes to show that perhaps sharing this special secret might not have been your primary motivation. Right. And, and, and going off of that, you know, what's funny is um, we're not going to claim here at Psychosmos that we have some magic pill that you can take, some special secret in order to change your life. A 10-step process that gives you everything you could have ever wanted and more. We're not going to tell you that we have that. Nobody has that. Nobody has that. But what we can tell you is that we have a multitude of source material, scientific studies, declassified governmental documents, um, secret religious and spiritual and secret society texts, some of which... And when we say secret, we don't mean that we're the only ones that have them. Right. We, we simply mean that at one point in their history, they were kept secret for specific purposes and or as time went on into now, they became so obscure and so unknown, but still holding a very important place in the history and development of other ideas around them. Yeah, and I think that what we can do is provide a, a, at least a decent example of that. Um, one of the texts that Richard and I have been reading over the past year, uh, Family Heirloom of Sorts, um, yes, is, pass, is it, passed down to me from uh, from my beloved late uncle. Yes, uh, who, who Richard's family has a connection to a specific... Um, organization, a specific secret society, if you will. Um, and the book that we own, which is on, you know, online, you would have to pay about $2,000 for this book, just to put in perspective. Well, for, for a good copy, although, uh, side note, for all you people out there, if you're interested in this book, um, I'm assuming you're referring to The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Yes, by, by Manly P. Hall. Manly P. Hall. He's a, he's a fantastic guy. He's got a lot of other books and lectures. This guy wrote extensively on metaphysical and philosophical topics. Yes. And um, so just for you guys, for your benefit, um, a lot of his stuff is out there online in the public domain. Mm -hmm. um, and It will the, be redacted. The Secret Teachings of All Ages is, um, you can find it on a site called Sacred Texts. Highly recommend you check out that site. There's that, also an app that you can download that has a redacted version. What redacted means is that over time, um, more than likely the government or some kind of organization meant to control the um, information that goes to the public, similar to the CIA or the FBI or something along those lines, took out specific information. Now, what I'm saying is that we have an unredacted version of that book to some extent because it's not the original copy from the 20s, but it is more... Uh, closer to that time period than the redacted versions than you can find online. So that gave Richard and I an edge in the information wars because not only were we able to get into the mindset of the people who have the most power, 
but we can also understand what they believe, what they think, um, or at least we can make assumptions about the, ma the majority of what they believe um, from the very basic level. Uh, and then from there we can learn how they utilize their power and their money and their influence to, in a sense, brainwash or control the, the public um, from the information that we have. So, so that is one area of expertise where we were kind of gifted uh, in that sense to, in order to bring you guys the general wisdom. And I'm not going to undersell this, um, you know, in, in a sense of uh, we are really putting a lot at risk by even discussing certain topics like this. And I'm not trying to bring any bad negative karma our way, but in a sense, you have to understand that this is not something that a lot of people understand at a basic level. This is not stuff that people just know or that people are shown or people – and it's definitely not something that people are taught in schools. Um, in the modern education system, whether you live in Europe, America, China, it doesn't matter. You're not taught specific things about the fundamentals of – Anything going from the human body to the way that the planet works uh, to the galaxy to um, animals and plants and you know reproduction and things of that nature. There, there are things that you, you understand a very basic level um, and you recognize that once you start reading deeper into the hidden mysteries. Um, so tying it all together, you know, we, we do an extensive amount of research. We, we vet every source that we get. Thoroughly, it's and to be to be clear, we are not perfect, mm -hmm. and we will likely make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So do not think that we are saying that we are perfect factual truth tellers. Right. And on that note, again, we are not telling you what is fact. We are telling you what we have found the truth to be based yes. on our sources, and yes. we are we try to back it up so that we are not just talking out of our ass. Right. Right. And we want to we want to provide the greatest aspect of truth to all of you listeners. We we want to make sure that we're not just saying something and then you take it at face value. We want you to understand things that have been probably kept hidden from you on purpose so that you can look into it yourself. Um, and what I will say, just from a very base perspective, Google is on trial right now. Parsa v. Google, it's a real court case so you can look up yourself. Google is on trial right now for... Uh, among many other things, one of the things that they're on trial for is uh, hiding information from the public. So if I you mean, and, and you, you can see, you can read Google statements, you can see them uh, being interviewed by various committees in, in Congress, and they will tell you, apparently to your face, they will say that Google participates in no form of altering of uh, search results or the order that they come in. And yet, it's common knowledge that you can pay more money to have your to have your your link come SEO, up as an ad, or you SEO can marketing, yes. or or social media marketing, which is in um, and of which is in and of itself manipulating the search results. Right. Those are those are just blanket business terms. As as the wealthy and the powerful normally do, they blanket these things in business terms like SEO, uh, search engine optimization, marketing. Um, but really, what that means is we're going to put either. On a basic level, it just looks as though the, the the whole industry, the whole vertical industry of SEO marketing, is just there to provide um, you know ad revenue and 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 different facets of, of of capitalism for businesses that are willing to pay a price to put their name at the top of the Google headline list. But what the people who have billions and trillions of dollars are doing is they're utilizing that same uh, capitalistic um, uh, facet to uh, hide information from the public. So the point that we're trying to drive home is do your own research, but, but and vet. you got to dig. You yeah, really got to dig. You, and, vet, and you have to vet the sources. Like you cannot, and I, we said this in the last podcast, but you absolutely cannot read a headline and an article and think you have the idea, even from a 10% level. You don't. Go to the source. I mean, just, I mean, I mean, I mean, sorry. <clears throat> Damn it. Um, and I mean, it's not even just a matter of reading the actual thing. It's about really looking at what the person right. is saying. Right. Because if someone refutes something or debunks something and they don't actually have a counter argument to it, then that is not, that is not a debunking. That mm -hmm. is not a refutation. And this happens quite a bit. So you I really can provide an example of that actually recently. Um, there's a lot of controversy right now. I'm not going to say whether it's true or not. 
I have my own held beliefs based off the research I have. There's a lot of talk that, for example, the Black Lives Matter organization is going to be giving a specific portion of the funds that they are receiving right now from, don from donations to the Democratic National Convention, which will probably ultimately give the money to Joe Biden. Um, however, I saw, you know, I don't know if it was Snopes or PolitiFact or one of those really, re you know, off uh, sites that generally speaking does not have a perfect track record in quote unquote fact, fact checking. checking, right, or debunking specific sources. Uh, you know, I remember seeing just last week, maybe two weeks ago, uh, you know, headline article no. Black Lives Matter is not giving all their money to Joe Biden or the Democratic National Convention. And then you read the article, and the article is, is about six paragraphs. The first paragraph says, no, it's not true, and here's why. And they provide one source with one link. And if you click on that link, it's a Twitter post from some random guy who says, no, it's not going to give the money to the DNC, and that's it. That's their source. So you're able to have... So, so you have to zoom out here and you have to say you have a journalist who doesn't know what they're talking about writing an article with no source material, pretending that they do have source material, material, writing one paragraph about why it's debunked with a source from a guy on Twitter, and then five paragraphs about a basically a conspiracy why Candace Owens and a bunch of other Republicans are just creating this thing out of nowhere with no evidence. You can actually find the evidence that a specific portion of the money that Act Blue receives through Black Lives Matter donations may go to the Democratic National Convention. But you have an article that, again, a journalist who doesn't know what they're talking about with a source that is not credible, and then basically drawing up a conspiracy theory in its own self, selling it that the other side is a conspiracy theory. It, it makes it, it, it's crazy that people can actually go to these lengths today. It's classic straw manning. This is what people don't realize about fact checkers because you hear the phrase fact checker and you think, well, it must have some objective method or constraints or cer so that, or certification. But it doesn't. This, no. it, this is the thing: is that it, at the end of the day, the people, the the organizations that make the fact checks are run by people and the and the way that it determines whether something is factual or not is by people doing quote unquote research right so when you so when you go to these places one you have to keep that in mind it's basically just a news organization it's the exact same snopes is no different from a news organization essentially it, in, in fact in, terms it's, of, in fact i would argue it's worse because it's one man and here's the history of snopes by the way if you're ever using snopes i'm not i'm not going to say you don't ever use it because then they'll write an article on why we're bs but uh snopes it was owned by a man and a woman who lived together in a small home with a cat they received a lot of very strange funding from specific organizations regarding specific articles that they wrote and then next thing you know after a few years and of course this was many years ago because snopes has been around for a while um you know a few years uh, ago the man divorced his wife um and married a, like a porn star or got with a porn star uh, and they are basically continuing to write the articles now. It's basically a man, uh, uh, an ex-porn star, and his cat. So, so, and remember, this guy has received hundreds of thousands, possibly even over a million dollars over the years, uh, writing articles, gaining money from. I remember specifically. I can't. I can't remember the specific article off the top of my head or what they were trying to fact check, but I know that they were tied to receiving funding from a medical institute writing an article about why some specific drug was safe versus unsafe. And they received met, they received funding. Snopes received funding in one instance from a medical organization because they wrote a pro stance article about the drug in question and then later had to take that information down because it was it was uh, uh, riddled with inaccuracies. So that's the type of thing. That, that's a, that's your fact checker. That's your common fact checker today. Every every person that does anything like this is is subject to the same pitfalls and shortcomings as any and biases as any human being out there that's trying to do stuff, us included. Mm -hmm. The difference is, and the problem that I have with Snopes and these fact checking places is, if you go and look at the claims that they make, what happens frequently is they will not address the actual claim being made. Right. They will take the claim, they will gussy it up, make it look a little more ridiculous, a little more outrageous, a little more conspiratorial, and then they will debunk that claim. But the problem is, is that 
that's not the real thing that they were supposed to be fact checking. Right. So, like, a, a, the great example of this would be the Act Blue thing because what will happen is we we would say something like Act Blue is a platform, Black Lives Matter uses it, and in part, Act Blue makes a sort of profit, quote unquote, off of this, and then it uses whatever money it makes to donate to the DNC. Then what would happen is Snopes would have a, a fact check, quote unquote, and they would say something along the lines of uh, YouTubers claim that Act Blue takes donations directly from Black Lives Matter and puts it into the pocket of Joe Biden. Right. And if you see, if you think that that sounds like a little bit of a caricature, which it is, it's not also because it's 110% accurate. They do this stuff all the time. Yep. They take a claim, they make it way, they make it so outrageous that you couldn't possibly prove it, of course, and then they disprove the outrageous claim, but they don't actually address the, the original claim. Yeah, the original the claim. The real claim. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and the whole reason that we're kind of going in on this rant um, to, to preface is basically. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had one more. I had one more perfect oh, example ahead, of this. I had one more perfect example of this with Snopes. Go and look at the saga of fact checking surrounding Donald Trump claiming that he was being phone tapped. Go look at yeah. it. Look at how they bend over backwards to try to to try to twist phraseology and specific words to make it false even though it's completely true yeah snopes did this all the time so they said so donald trump said he's been phone tapped and they said that's not true and then in the article down there after they said it's mostly false they say well it's mostly false that donald trump's phone wasn't tapped however the fbi did get a series of wiretaps to monitor all the communications of his of his campaign it's like right. well, hold on hold on how the how the fuck can you say that when he says that he's being that he's being that he has his calls tapped and monitored you say no that's completely false all that happened was they were monitoring his communications yeah that that, that is not how fact checking works right Snopes. and all right. these organizations do stuff like this very frequently they're not unbiased they're extremely biased and that's and the that's, point that, I, that we want to make yeah. so we're not saying don't look at them we're not saying don't read the articles you know but when you're gonna google something like did george soros say he wants to destroy america and the first politifact link and and then there's a whole bunch of different and, and, other and the claim is links. did george soros say that he really wanted to slit the throats of american citizens it's like nobody's no, saying this yeah, exactly and that's an exact of course that, that that's hyperbole but like that is the type of things that they will the pick jfk up. speech is a perfect example jfk had a speech on secrecy he did discussed how there was a conspiracy within America, even at, even at his time. It was about, I, I think it was six or eight months before he was assassinated. And Snopes today says, nope, JFK never said that. You can find the speech on YouTube, people. Like, this is what we're trying to say. Yes, you can use them if you really want to, but look at what the sources they're providing as the counter argument. Look at to why the fact they're check. saying it's true or false. Yeah. And look at, look at the claim, look at the claim that other people have made what they've actually said, and then look at the claim that Snopes or whatever fact-checking organization makes and see how different they are and then ask yourself, why are they so different? And right. The, and the final point on this is the main reason why I think that these that they, they have so much power is because they have cultivated this, this false halo of authority mm -hmm. where just by virtue of the name fact-checker, and a lot of – it's unfortunately yeah. a very common trend where l language and the name of something is used – as, as evidence of what its credibility, uh, evidence of its credibility, and evidence of what the members of it stand for. Yes. So for Snopes, you have fact checking. For Black Lives Matter, you have Black Lives Matter. They pick the name Black Lives Matter because, of course, most people in this country agree with the sentiment behind that. Yes. But they use that name specifically so that if you take problem with something that the movement is doing or the leaders are doing or specific members are doing and you point this out, they can come back with the, oh, so you don't think black lives matter. Mm. So of course I do. But just because I disagree with your organization and you have that name doesn't mean that I disagree with the sentiment. But it's, right. a, it's, it's a sneaky little tricky game. And I'm not saying that they paid that name, that they picked that name specifically to do that i'm saying that that is the tactic that has been involved in and the other great example of that is antifa right where you know people say how can they be bad their name is anti-fascist they stand for fascism okay well look you can't just you can't just give yourself a name and then do anything you want you can't call yourself the good guys the yeah. good guy club and then go around beating people in the streets and then being like oh well no we're the good guy club we stand right. up to the bad guys it's right. in our name how do you not get this it's right. like that's the type of thing that, that they're pulling. That we're saying. Yeah. The, 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 their name and the, this aura, this 
this facade veil Action of, speak of, of louder authority. than words. Action speaks exactly. louder than words. And the, the, so why are we going off 25 minutes when we said we were going to talk about secret societies? Is because we want you guys to understand who are listening right now how diligently we do our own vetting and source sourcing for a lot of this stuff. Now, this, you got to do this. This is years of us doing this in the making. Okay, we, we are in our mid-20s, and we have been doing this research since we were in college. Just to give you perspective, we have been looking into shit like this for a very long time. We've been following the, the, the breadcrumb trails for a very long time. I specifically was very heavily involved when everything was going on in 2016 for the uh, the Trump election. I was I was there when I was able to see WikiLeaks providing all these emails and reading through them and on, asking myself why is Hillary Clinton saying that they're ordering sixty five thousand dollars worth of hot dogs or pizza or or why is Barack Obama saying they're going to get eighty thousand dollars worth of chicken? You know, using FBI pedophile terms: chicken, pizza, cheese pizza. Um, all these other things. I was asking myself these questions, you know, years ago, and that was even that was even too late compared to some of the other people who were already getting in that bandwagon, who were being labeled as conspiracy theorists and all this other crap by the the general media and uh, the government. And then, you know, years later, now you have all of them on trial because there are videos of Hillary Clinton doing terrible things to children on the deep web. That's where we're at right now. So the whole point that we're trying to get at here. Um, conspiracies aside is we look very heavily and vet all the sources and all the information that we get um, if, if we had the funding check out our Patreon if we had the funding we'd actually start our own news organization but the, the issue is that we all are again in our mid-twenties we all have decent jobs we're all working diligently you know a lot of other people our age are playing video games or, or trying to go out and on hikes you know they're 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 eating good food or they're traveling they're trying to enjoy life we're trying to basically save as much of the sane minded world that is left as best as possible and that's what and expand on it and expand on it and try to i mean one of one of the things that we really appreciate is is the old the archaic old the library of alexandria our whole goal is to hopefully get to a point where we can have another one of those so the whole point of team psychosis one that won't burn down right one that won't burn down by 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 uh, the romans and julius caesar and uh, crazy christian extremists uh, 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 the point i'm trying to get at here is we have done so much research so much effort every single day for years this is not just something that we wanted to pick up and decided that we were just going to do one day and try to um you know try to just oh well maybe it'll work maybe it won't kind of kind of thing this is something where we really we're really trying to get a message out so with all that being said why don't we uh, kind of tie this into some of the yes. so, more secretive stuff? So what the fuck are we going to talk about now? That's, that's a real question. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the stuff is going to be uh, a little more historical based. It's not going to be a lot of current events necessarily. Right. Uh, we'll try to relate it back, I'm sure, to some stuff. Yes. Um, and it's also going to be primarily have to do with a lot of philosophical, religious uh, metaphysical, S spiritual, spiritual type sci things. scientific in a lot of cases. There, the science, the be... science definitely plays a part. Yes, but the way that we're going to be talking about it is going to be uh, less so about numbers and cell counts and chemistry mm. than it is. It's going to be about scientific theory. Um, and I would say probably bridging the gap between what people understand about religion and spirituality now versus what they were thinking n even a couple hundred years ago, let alone for thousands of years of human history and progress. And so b before we get into that, I, I just want to, I want to break, I want to try to break down a little bit of a misconception that I think a lot of people have that I think will hopefully be helpful here. And it's that. The further back in time you go, the more superstitious and more or less the dumber most people get. That's the general assumption. It's a common mis. I think that's a common assumption that a lot of uh, historians and archaeologists even now make frequently. Right. Um, I think it's in part because we have misunderstood yes. how advanced and how much thought the the ancients, as they're as they're often referred to, the people that came before us, put into their systems. And I think it's also in part much smaller part I like to think but in smaller part I think it's because of a sort of uh, a sort of arrogance yeah 
Um, because to this, I mean, to this day, yes, I'm sure you can find some main sources that will tell you contrary to what I'm going to say. But to this day, there is no good working theory or explanation for how precisely something is something is simple, grand, and beautiful as the pyramids were built. Something that simple, something right? That, that simple of a question, we still don't know. Supposedly, and arche- allegedly, and archaeologists have theories, and they they archaeologists and historians have theories, and they have and they say these theories with uh, I, what I think is an undue amount of conviction. Mm-hmm. But they do so because I think they have a hard time coming to terms with the fact that perhaps these people that lived thousands of years ago had technology or a system or a method right. of doing things that today, by our standards, with all of our technology and expertise, we would we, we could do, but it would be very difficult. Very, right. very difficult. Right. And I think that a lot of people... They they can't handle that. Right. They want to think of they want to think of the people in the past as being Dumb. dumber than us, Dumb, as, yeah. as 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 if intelligence and intelligence and wisdom is a literally a upward moving line. Or oh, sorry, as if. If, if intelligence is is, is, is moving is constantly in upward. reference, yeah, in reference with the movement of forward progressing time. But basically, as yeah. time moves forward, all we get of humanity smarter. has gone has gone smarter, and and that that that's been the general trend. And I don't, I just don't think that that's necessarily fair. Yeah, and I think it doesn't give the ancients the credit that they're due because sure. everything that we have is built on their foundation, mm-hmm. and on top of that, we have so many misunderstandings as to what the the ancients actually thought yeah, and their interpretations of things that 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 bleeds into us viewing them as superstitious and dumber right so uh, and here's a great example i'm gonna throw it out there is um this the modern scientific community okay and and i'm gonna throw a couple of statements number one we love science on this channel science is is, is, is fucking awesome i love the okay. discipline not the institution right and that's that's exactly what we're getting into when you talk to somebody about science, the modern definition is something along the lines of the the nature, uh, the the math, uh, the basically the math and the the the, com- the compartments of nature, how nature works, the inner workings of nature, such as gravity or something along those lines. You know, planets are natural; they 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 form naturally uh, in the scientific community. Um, so thus, you know, an electromagnetic sphere or gravitational, um, you know, pull, those are, those are scientific terms that explain the nature of these things. But for, for much, much longer than science has been around, this was modern or not modernly, but, but anciently referred to as magic with a K or, um, or or God's you know essence or God's presence thing, things of that nature. It was it they was, would even they would even sometimes refer to their own discipline as a science or an art. Right. It, or yeah, especially an art um, for sure. And and that's excuse me. That's that's kind of where we're at right now, which is the modern scientific community um, through malicious funding. I would say this is my opinion um, is very conceded and the reason is because they think that a lot of their findings are are infallible but they they see their understanding of the world um and they say well we might not have it right down to the most decimal degree but we still have it right better than people back in the day but when you look at things like the pyramids and we're sitting here with our greatest scientific minds apparently not able to figure out how they built it and the, the most common run uh, theories on it are completely easily debunked. You, 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 you can shoot a hole through them in about two seconds flat. Right. So, so the question begs, what the hell why, why the hell are these the people within the scientific community so conceited? It's basically because when science was really first founded during things such as, you know, you could, I guess argue the, the breaking of the Reformation and the um, you know right around there, maybe, I, I guess you could argue from from that point on, the whole purpose of having faith in science, and I'm going to use that because I think it's always sunny in Philadelphia. I had a really great segment on that where oh, yeah. you have to put faith 
into science. Like you're not reading through the data yourself. No, nope, you're not. not. You're, we're you're taking you're, the you're, words of people. Ninety nine percent of you, if you're really gonna sit there and tell me you read through scientific case studies, the ninety nine percent of you I know are bullshitting. You don't read through the shit. You just you read through headline articles and you take what NASA or any other scientific community that has certifications based off of what the government gave them, you take their word for value for face value but they still can't explain shit like the pyramids it's either they can't and a, and a explain the, it or they don't want you to know how it was done it's and, one or the other and a lot of the time they will they will not explain things like mm-hmm. even now mm-hmm. they will they will sim- they will say things they they will they will speak they will speak generally about a specific scientific problem and then they will just tell you what you need to do about it. Right. And that seems to be the primary focus nowadays in science. Not mm. not how did you come to the conclusion? How valid is a conclusion? Is it repeatable? Um, what's, yeah. what's your motivation for Where, doing where's it? Where's the test where's, data? Where's the, where's the funding for it? What's yeah. the test data? All of this stuff. That is pushed to the wayside and it pales in comparison to, okay, but now what are you telling us we should do about this? Right. And this is troubling because in my opinion, I have a serious problem with any authority figure appealing to their own authority to not properly explain their reasoning and their argument and why they got to the conclusion that they did. Yeah. Because in my mind, whether you're studying whether you're studying transmigratory patterns of disparate peoples in Egypt in 3000 BC, mm-hmm. or you're studying the precise way that mitochondrial DNA up, uh, updates itself right. within an animal cell, it doesn't matter. If you're an expert in your field, you should be able to explain these things in a rational, reasonable, common sense way, in common terms that everybody can understand. Mm-hmm. And if you can't do that, in my mind, I only have two criticisms. One, if you can't do that, then Perhaps, not guaranteed, but perhaps you either don't have as strong of a grasp on the material that you want to talk about as you thought, or perhaps you can't articulate it in an effective manner, and that does matter in how valid your conclusions are, because right. otherwise it's just in your head, and you're basically just telling me, no, but it's right. right. And the second crit- main criticism that I have with this, and this is the big one, is you do not get to just say as a scientist i looked at a study here is the n line sentence conclusion and now i am going to dictate policy that will affect millions of people right you don't get to do that in my mind right i think it's incredibly unfair and disingenuous if you want to if you want to push for a policy that will affect millions of people in ways that you have no idea how pervasive or widespread these effects will be you have no idea absolutely none mm-hmm. but if you're still going to push for policy change you you better be damn capable of explaining how and why these conclusions are valid how and why this policy change is is in your opinion the best the best course forward and most importantly how and why you came to this conclusion mm-hmm. and and the issue is that there many of the times you know if you go and you trace back claims and scientific case studies and things of that nature you'll find that the information that's actually very heavily um difficult to understand but if you get through it with jargon if you get through the jargon um then you're able to find that a lot of what the common misconceptions about scientific theories are actually not as far well thought out as as you might think i can give a very good example the everybody knows Sir Isaac Newton, he came up with the universal law of gravity. It's still called the universal law of gravity. The man was from four or five hundred years ago, and we still call it the universal law of gravity, even though it's been disproven to work on a subatomic particle level, I think at Planck level, it could be completely uh, inaccurate with that, but I believe... When it gets down to the Planck level, gravity, the, his, his universal law no longer applies. And then when it gets to a level that is so large, um, 
probably far larger than our sun, probably far larger than maybe even our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, once it gets to a certain part of being so large, it, it, it doesn't work either. So the universal law, and I'm, again, I'm using these air quotes, it's called the universal law, as in everything within the universe should work based off of this e equational function. And for, you know, 99% of things that, that we interact with that we see, I mean, we don't see subatomic level. We don't see, you know, larger than the Milky Way level. We're human beings. So for everything that we're ever going to interact with in our lives, yes, it, it, it absolutely checks out. But if you're going to claim that it's called the universal law, well, now we have to take a step back. We have to understand that that's not the case. That's not how it works. And we need to, and maybe I'm ignorant on this, maybe they do have theories that go beyond uh, those small and large levels, but we need to come up with a, not only a different name, maybe the, the humanitarian perspective law of gravity, maybe the, the human perspective law of gravity. That is a perfect name because that's exactly what it is. It's from our own perspective. But you can't call it a universal law, and yet millions of people believe that Sir Isaac Newton has it perfect down flat. The scientific community does not acknowledge this. They, they, you can find articles about it, you can read case studies about it, but they don't fully acknowledge, hey, Isaac Newton wasn't 100% accurate. Now, of course, you, you, how are you gonna blame the man who lived 400 years ago and couldn't find things at Planck level, couldn't find things bigger than the Milky Way because he didn't have the technology? So it's an unfair thing for me to be attacking Newton and I'm not attacking Newton at all. What I'm saying is, why the fuck is the scientific community they got such big balls looking at the fucking universal law of gravity saying, God damn, this is like amazing. I can't believe we're using a 400 year old outdated method to prove other shit that's going on modernly. It makes no fucking sense. The scientific community, again, this is just one example, needs to clean up the way that they do it and they need to stop having such arrogance and hubris in the way that they perform these, these tests and the way that they are able to analyze things. Like, another great example is climate change. Can somebody sit me down and explain everything that's going on with climate change? You couldn't. And I'm saying that like like face value. You couldn't because even the people who who are very, very, you know, pro climate change and they want to save the planet, which, you know, we also want to save the planet, uh, but we also look at statistical data and actual facts rather than just, you know, uh, oh, carbon emissions are extremely high, so the planet's you know, uh, natural ozone layer is going to get destroyed. Well, that's just one facet. That's just one facet. Most people, most people believe that the majority of oxygen we get from the planet are from trees. But did you know that we could easily survive if every tree on this planet was, was chopped down? We could. And the reason is because the majority of oxygen we get are not from trees. It's been scientifically proven that it's from algae and uh, microplankton and other forms of aquatic life, which make up the majority of the planet, the, ma the majority of the planet's water, the aquatic life that gives off oxygen is actually what sustains the majority of the oxygen, about 70%, I believe, of the majority of the oxygen within our uh, atmosphere. It's not from, it's not all from trees. Now, trees, of course, are very important. We shouldn't chop down trees. That's not important. But why don't we talk about the algae? Why are we not talking about how algae is important in the equation? We're talking about rainforests and trees, which rainforests set, are set on fire uh, every year from the, the natural way that the earth kind of processes uh, its, its cycles. And uh, there are also a lot of man-made fires as well that are, are significant in the impact of burning of trees. So how are we just going to claim that it's climate change, but there's all these different facets of information which aren't um, you know, com uh, completely up at the face value of these claims. And yet you'll have thousands of people who will go on a march for climate change saying that we can't chop down trees. And, and, and often a common defense is, oh, it's, it's, it's very complicated. Right. It's, it's too complex. It, there's too much jargon. And, and, it's like, and, and what, and, what and Rich again, is referring to is, is the scientific community trying to explain things. And, and that's a phenomenal and, point. They always tell you it's either, too complicated. They will, either tell, they will only tell you, basically, it, it, it's what I hear frequently, is they will tell you um, the, the, they'll go very vaguely into what experiment they were doing. Mm -hmm. and, but, but normally they'll tell you what they were trying to find. And this is another problem I have with. I get it. The, the goal of science is you want to find out something about something. So you formulate a hypothesis and then you test it. But what happens a lot is the hypotheses that scientists put forward are so specific and it's, it's not even a matter of 
we want to find out how, how X interacts with Y. And my hypothesis is that if I do something to X, it will interact with Y in Z way. Right. But instead what happens more and more that I notice is they are going into the study with the goal of trying to prove their hypothesis, mm -hmm. not, not, not seeing if it works. And I know that sounds like right. kind of the same thing, but it's really a big difference. And that, that, that's what's going on with modern science now is they go into a study about, so it's not just, let, I think that thing X, if I do thing X, if I do something to thing X, it'll interact with thing Y in Z way. That's not what they're doing though. They're going, I think that X will interact with Y in Z way. And I'm gonna, and I'm going to study if that's true. That's right. a, that's a little bit of a different thing in a significant mm -hmm. way because now, first of all, your your goal is to not test your hypothesis. Your goal is to prove your hypothesis. So now you might have a different, you might have more of a tendency to ignore contrary evidence uh, or evidence that is contrary to your hypothesis because you might. View, you might look at it and think, well, this doesn't prove my, this doesn't disprove my hypothesis. This was just, this was just one piece of evidence. This was just one little thing. And if I can find more evidence to support the hypothesis than against it, then it must be true. And th that's not how it's supposed to work, my guy. Right. And, and, and going off of that phenomenal point, by the way, um, the, uh, another great example is if you take a look at uh, torus fields versus um, what the actual subatomic particles look like. So you were probably taught in school, if you were taught a, a standard education, standard world edu education, uh, what an atom looks like. And I'm sure if I, as I'm saying that, you're probably imagining what it looks like in your head. It's, you know, a ball. Uh, the ball, Jimmy Neutron atom. The, Jim, the Jimmy Neutron atom. The ball-like shape with a, a bunch of, um, you know, smaller little orbs all compact together with a ring around it that has an electron that goes, you know, around and around and around. What if I told you you can easily find plenty of claims and plenty of uh, uh, quotes from scientists, modern modern scientists in the last 20 years who will tell you that, yeah, that's not what an atom looks like. We tell people that's what an atom looks like because it would be too complex to tell them what it actually looks like. Well, that's just fucking bullshit. I mean, uh, whether... I can't prove what it looks like because I don't have a, a telescope to show you a picture, but you want to know what's funny? Microscope. Neither... You know, yes, I'm sorry. I don't have a microscope to prove what a subatomic particle looks like. Neither does the scientific community, apparently. They can't, they, have you ever actually seen an actual at, picture of an atom? No, you haven't, because one never, d they don't exist as, as of 2020. They don't exist. So, and this is, uh, sorry, th th I want to go into this too, because now we're getting into a, a, another thing where we, uh, another great example of science sort of ignoring contrary information. Right. And a great example of this is related to atoms and it's related to subatomic particles and it has to do with the, uh, I think it's called the special theory of relativity. Mm. So I'm not very familiar with Einstein's theory of relativity, to, to be frank. I don't, I don't know much about it on a technical level. But what I do know is that in recent years, even when Einstein was still alive, scientists were discovering, discovering evidence of subatomic particles behaving in such a way that directly violates the laws of of quantum of uh, of quantum mechanics mm -hmm. of, of of Einstein's theory of relativity. Right. And one of the main one of the main pieces of this that's really interesting, and you should definitely look into this, is hold on, I have to look up the exact the exact thing. That's fine because I I have one pulled up right here. Uh, you know, while Rich is pulling up his uh, one of his sources for the Einstein thing, I can tell you personally, you can go and find this declassified CIA document that discusses atoms and torus fields. Um, the specific subject title of the CIA document is Analysis and Assessment of the Gateway Process, uh, and it is approved for release two thousand three, um, September tenth. It's dated June 9th, 1983, okay? So we're talking about, they were discussing the actual, the actual design of atomic particles in 83. This wasn't declassified until 20 years later, and people still are taught what an atom looks like in high school, uh, you know, high school and middle school, to be something completely different. This is CIA-RDP96-00788. R zero zero one seven zero zero two one zero zero one six dash five. 
Department of the Army. I know that was probably a lot, but that's the source right there. If you really want it, you can go look it up yourself, you can find it yourself, and you can read about torus fields in relation to electromagnetism. And that's, and that's significant because, let me tell you, the U.S. government, especially at top secret program level, they do not sink time, money, and resources into something unless they are very convinced that there's a high likelihood that they will get something out of it. Exactly. The U.S. Gov- you, I understand that a lot of people have opinions on what we spend our money on and everything, and I get that. But strictly speaking, within the U.S. military, especially for projects like these – that involve a lot of time mm-hmm. and manpower and resources. You have to be at a specific location. Millions to, of dollars. Of they funding. take it very seriously and they do not like it when people waste their time with bullshit. Right. So they do not just entertain these notions just, well, let's just see what happens. I mean, whatever. No, 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 no. They, if, they, if they go forward with this project, it's because they have a good reason to believe they'll get something out of it. And what normally happens is they have these projects open for years and then they end up getting shut. They end up getting shut down, and then the government just kind of throws their hands up in the air and go, "Ah, man, we didn't find anything." Yeah, that's a bunch of nonsense. You're, if you're going to tell me, "Oh, okay, so you kept the program going for 20 years, and then you didn't find anything," so then why would you keep it going for 20 years? Are you saying that in that entire 20 year span, you just kept getting feedback that was the equivalent of, "We haven't got anything yet, but we're still looking. We haven't got anything yet, but we're still looking," that's and you let that go? For, that, that's not how it works at all. Mm-hmm. And also, you got to think, if they found something, they wouldn't tell you. This happens all the time. Right. All the time the government does this. The right. government cl- – MK Ultra, perfect example. Like I'm sorry we're getting off topic here. But government does stuff all the time and it says that it's not going on and it's completely untrue up to years after the program ends. Right. And then more years and years later, it finally admits, yeah, we actually did that thing. Yeah. And by then, it's either lost interest or people aren't aware of it or aren't – as aware of it or generational it's too late or generation exactly and that's and that's exactly why they do things like this yeah they, ba- they basically just hope that if we keep this out of the public if we keep this out of the public eye long enough then and then we admit to it then we can have we can have the cake of the people not knowing about it and we can eat it because we can then we can take the credit for being like yes, we're very sorry, we admitted this thing and it should never have happened and it's a great travesty. It's like, get the fuck out of here. Right. So so the reason that we're bringing this up, of course, you know, we're almost an hour into this Oh, I'm podcast. sorry, I had, my, I had the name for the thing. Oh, yeah, go I ahead. Had, I'm go sorry. Ahead. Uh, the thing that I was referring to earlier, uh, one of the things that's come out now, it's really, really interesting. I highly recommend people looking into it. Um, it's a little bit hard to understand with a lot of the jargon. I'm not saying that as an I can't explain it to you, although I can't. What I'm saying is, it's tricky to read through this stuff because of the way that they choose to write about right. it and the jargon that they use. Yep. But basically, the long and short of it is there is this, there's this phenomenon it's called quantum entanglement. And it directly flies in the face of Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, right. or, at least part, or at least part of it. And quantum entanglement is more or less when particles or objects, but it's normally, it's normally a phenomenon that's common with subatomic particles. They, when they're in close proximity and they have a relationship with one another, they sort of, they go through this thing called quantum entanglement. And basically, I'm butchering it because I'm not a science. So you're going to have to forgive me with my common language. But more or less, the two particles rub off on one another and they each get a little bit of the essence of the other one. Mm -hmm. is a a good way to think of it Mm -hmm. and so what then happens is these two particles can go across vast distances in the universe and yet when thing happens to particle a it will happen to particle b instantaneously yeah so it's crazy so these things react to one another through this phenomenon of quantum entanglement and in such a way that you can't even view the two particles as completely independent of one another anymore. Right. And this is something that actually happens. And the reason that it just, at least in part, spits in the face of Einstein's theory of relativity is part of his theory is basically the, the further away you get from an object, the less – the further away one object gets away from another object, the less, the uh, less influence, inf- yeah, influence it has to a point where basically if you get away far enough – the influence is so negligible as to be virtually virtually zero v- virtually zero yeah and on top of that if as you know einstein also has a thing where there's nothing faster than the speed of light but this directly violates it because one it's pr- 
practically instantaneous. The, right. The, the changes between these regardless two of the distance, regardless of the distance. So you can take light year travel out of the equation, and and then on top of that, it, it also so so for those two reasons, it 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 sorry for those two reasons, it has huge problems with with Einstein's theories of relativity, mm. and even when Einstein was alive. And some of this evidence was beginning to come up. He basically ignored it. Yeah. He couldn't deal with it. He yeah. refused to accept it. And this is this is what I'm getting at. As in, that is not a unique outlier. Right. Because one stuff one that is Albert Einstein. So if he is going to be the paradigm and the and, and the model for what a scientist is and what a, ge- a scientific genius is, that's fine. But then I'm also going to use him as a model for the potential flaws yeah. of scientists in that. He developed a theory that was so brilliant, so wonderful, and that fit so many pieces of the puzzle together. And so many people thought it was absolutely brilliant that when he started finding direct scientific evidence that pointed out problems in the pieces of his puzzle, pointed out holes where some of the pieces didn't fit together, he just ignored it. Mm. And that is the, that is the, that is the death of science right there. Yep. And we've been doing that. For a long time. For a long time, ever since. And, and this is what happens because you – you people don't understand that uh, between biases, reputations, pride, vanity, and funding – And grant funding. Most of the time you, it's you money. Need to, you need to prove what you said you were going to prove to continue your work and to continue getting grant money because of all these things scientists today – and they always sort of have this, but especially more so today, they have a vested interest in proving or disproving whatever is most profitable for them along those different facets. Yes, and and um, I personally have worked on Wall Street in the past. Um, I personally have worked for biz, big businesses and small businesses alike. Uh, and I have a pretty decent career, uh, I would say, that I've set for myself. But in that comes the experience of understanding the back end of how money influences things. I've worked for large billion-dollar corporations in New York City. I've worked, I've worked for small businesses that have worked heavily with the government. I've actually worked with the police in the past on, on um, technology-related projects for uh, surveillance and things like that. So I actually have a semblance of understanding how slow – and disorganized and completely bullshit the method of basically trying to prove certain things or get funding to show scientific evidence and data a lot of it just comes down to money at the end of the day and it's very sad and that is basically what we're building our scientific uh, uh, thought processes and, and um, theories on today. So what we'd like to do is we'd kind of like to, you know, at this point in the podcast, we'd like to shift focus and explain to you why all of this information is important because it absolutely is relatable to everything that's going on on the back end of human society. So now we got this uh, precursor junk out of the way. Sorry about that. We kind of went on a little longer than we uh, had originally intended, but mm-hmm. these things happen. Mm-hmm. But now that we've got this precursor stuff out of the way, we can sort of dive into the, the topics that we wanted to talk about. So the first one that we wanted to talk about is, I think, the most important. I think it's the basis of all these other sources of ancient wisdom. And that's astrology. Right. Uh, or, well, let me be clear. When I say astrology, I'm referring to what is now astronomy because right. these things have split. And nowadays, astrology is mostly associated with uh, daily horoscopes reading, daily horoscope readings and sort of what I would call a trivial, shallow understanding of things like sun signs and the influences of the planet and so on and so forth. Heavily based in superstition, more than likely, and, and probably more so a psyop, a psychological operation to deter people from actually looking into the science of the stars, if that makes sense. And, and whereas nowadays, the role of astronomy, which is actually scientifically observing and tracking celestial bodies although nowadays it's more of a focus on deep space mm. but previously in the past uh astrology was the science of tracking the movements of celestial bodies in the sky for the purposes of knowing everything from the changing of the seasons to uh to influences of the moon on tides and even menstrual cycles to determining 
even to even determining things like omens, which may mm-hmm. which, which may or may not have been true. Right. But the point being that the the people that first came up with this system of astrology, it is completely overshadowed and under under unappreciated mm-hmm. how brilliant these people were to figure this stuff out, how much time yep. and intelligence and focus they must have had. Right. Because if you think about it, pretty much as soon as civilization starts to spring up as we as as we know it, and right as right as we get to the point where we can point to a group of people and say this group of people has an established established civilization they have homes they have domesticated animals they have something resembling farming they have a, so they have something resembling a, a series of social classes they have a ruler they have something like government as soon as that comes on the scene these people already have a system of astrology yes and they're writing about it they already have a system of tracking the movement of celestial bodies in the sky of knowing where specific stars are of knowing how long it takes for them to reappear in specific uh, specific points and the thing about that that's so incredible is to know that mm. the way that they did to the accuracy they did which right. we still have to admit today was incredible how accurate they were mm-hmm. that must have taken generations upon generations just like just abs- an absurd amount of time to actually be able to prove it because if you think about how long it takes for a planet to go full off go through a full rotation if you will and return to its same place right in the night sky in the same sign and that takes a, an incredible amount of time right and rich is making a, a number of wonderful um you know factual sharings with with you guys with the community but um to zoom out i want to i want to discuss why exactly you know rich rich and i are so kind of stubborn on the importance of this uh, and, and mainly it's because everything that you do today revolves around these processes that they made thousands of years ago you don't believe me you want proof how many months are there in a year there are 12 the same as there are the number of zodiac signs generally speaking um the same number uh, 12 is actually very very sacred number uh 12 followers of jesus 12 apostles 12, 12 tribes, tribes of, of israel. israel that's another one um and that's only that's only in the judeo christian faith i mean um the the there are roughly 30 days every month month stems from the word moon it, it comes from that word because a revolution of the moon cycle takes 28 days. You know what else also takes 28 days? A woman's period and ovulation cycle, one full cycle of that. Um, you know, and if you want to look at it in like a uh, transcendental kind of way, a full moon could be seen as when a woman is ovulating, and uh, and the new moon could be when a woman has her period. And metaphorically, met- speaking. metaphorically speaking, of course, that's just an example. But that's that's the point that I'm trying to drive home here, which is the ancient people were able to see this. They were able to understand that there are 365 days in a year, the same as there are 360 degrees in a circle. And and the problem that that we have with modern science when it looks at this is they they seem to basically they think so what if they were right they're they thought stupid stuff so they were stupid and that's like so basically what i mean by that is you would point out hey they figured out that like a month is one cycle of the moon and they even figured out that the moon has an influence of not only tides but the but the female menstrual cycle right not that it it, not that it controls it but that it influences it and you can and you can use the moon for help in tracking perhaps the timeline of this right and there's even some science to suggest this but but instead rather than address that claim science will address the other claim which is basically they'll find the most stupid person that they can find and the most stupid superstitious motivation that they can find for why somebody would think that and then they would say oh well that's why they thought that right so they would say well well they didn't know, they didn't know that the moon had gravitational effect on the tides they just thought it was a magic wizard that was making the tides going out <laughs> and she's like well you know first of all you don't know that you literally don't know that right. and secondly even if that's true at a certain point what the fuck does it matter right like honestly you you want to talk about th- they thought it was a wizard on the moon that was doing it okay but they were still able to look and see hmm tide going out at specific times hmm moon hmm the moon affects the tides right and instead of instead of instead of appreciating 
how insightful and smart that was. Instead, what science wants to do is they want to focus on, what, but how can we, how can we undermine it? Mm -hmm. How can we make it seem like the people of the past had an inkling of something smart, but they were really stupid. And it was only until we came along in our infinite wisdom, standing on their shoulders to actually properly say what was true and the real motivations and the real, uh, the real sequence of events that leads to these effects. Right. And it's, it's, it's just, it, it's counterproductive. It's unnecessary. And like I said, at a certain point, it doesn't matter. It's arrogance. It, it's, it, it's pure arrogance. People don't want it. They, it's such a hard thing to admit, and I don't understand why, to just think, you know what? Somebody else thousands of years ago had to be the first people to develop this system. And it has been improved on, sure, but somebody had to start it. Right. And they had to be pretty damn smart to be the pioneer in that regard. So maybe we should mm -hmm. appreciate that more instead of sneering at the people in the past for these supposed superstitious beliefs that we think that they had. Right. Like, you know, a perfect example is the uh, the Ptolemaic method of, um, of, of basically where we are in the universe. The, the common understanding is, you know, that, and they'll teach you this in school. People thought the earth was the center of the universe back in the day. There's no evidence to, to, to really show that people in general, cultures across the world, all believed, okay, you know. They, that the earth was in the center of the solar system and everything else revolved around it. The only, the only backing they have for that are diagrams showing the earth as the central point to show the alignment of the planets. But even then, it's completely taken out of context because people don't understand that that's from a earth's perspective and that was their primary concern because to them first of all they didn't have all the scientific methods that we have that we have now today right and also even more importantly than that though they saw look at the end of the day it doesn't matter if if well, it doesn't matter what's in the center and what's revolving around what mm. what matters is that when you are here on this planet that is what you see you you see what appears to be everything revolving around you mm -hmm. and that's what they were interested in for the purposes of tracking the movements right and then you not understanding the place in the solar system but it, and, and and if you think about it that it, again that's what really matters mm -hmm. it doesn't if if you're trying to determine how long a month is and you're looking at the phases of the moon but you're so caught up on what's revolving around what then you're gonna you're gonna undermine yourself and second guess yourself at every single point in time and being like, well, what if the moon is what if the moon is counterclockwise spinning and then it starts clockwise spinning and it's is orbiting in reverse around the Earth and then the Earth is orbiting in reverse around? The, it's like none of that matters because you can just look up and you can see what's going on and then you can go from there and you right. you can use that rudimentary visual observation to track time and that that is the practical important thing for the people at the time. Exactly them knowing how far away the moon was from, that would have been useless to them in, a yeah. practi in practically speaking. Right, and, and, and the only use it would have been is to, to track future movements, which is what main, mainly people who were known as magi, uh, you know, magicians, wizards, or anything of the sort, that's what they were known as back in the day. And people looked down on that, but I mean, you know what, fuck that. Seriously, you had, you had kings and queens who hired astrologers uh, to be able to predict when they were going to die and give them fortune readings. And, and, and you, you, you had all these influential people in history all throughout time who were looking up at the stars because that was the heavens. That was the, that was the greatest understanding of our tiny existence was to look up at the night sky or, or even the day sky and try to figure out what the fuck is going on. And additionally, you had cultures from all over the world. Just want to, if you want to take the moon as an example, you have Aphrodite, Diana, Isis, Freya, Selene, Ceres, Lilith, Kali, Hecate. You had a whole bunch of different, you know, manifestations of these basically women that were superimposed onto the the you know the physical body of the moon because they knew the moon represented in some kind of metaphysical way. Uh, it had some sort of influence or some sort of uh, uh, direct tie to a woman's period cycle and, and her fertility cycle. And then on top of that, you're, you're sitting there thinking, well, that's, that's, that's just a coincidence. It's just 28 days for both you know, a, a, the moon cycle and a woman's cycle. Hell of a coincidence. Hell of a, hell of a coincidence, especially since in the 1960s, there was a gynecologist by the name of Dr. Eugene Jonas who, with a 98% 
uh, accuracy reading was able to discover that a woman's cycle is in fact synced up with the moon. And the reason that they were able to put this together was because they did the math on when the woman was born in relation to their ovulation cycle. And they found that 98% of women who they studied, this was before birth control. This was before birth control was, is able to regulate the cycle. It was shortly before birth control actually, because birth control was, was released in the late sixties, early seventies. So right around the time that this Slovakian gynecologist started experimenting with thousands, thousands of women, and they had a great control group, they had a wonderful study, and they proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the phase of the moon that a woman is born in, the day that, so if a woman is born on the full moon, for example, okay, her birth date of that year fell on a full moon, after she hits puberty, the the every single full moon if she's not on birth control if she's not on something that's gonna you know make her cycle irregular or she doesn't have some sort of disease that's why it's 98 percent accuracy the cycle of the moon that she was born under is going to be the same cycle that syncs up with her ovulation date which is why every 28 days which is roughly a month it seems as though you know with a with a um you know a semblance of a, of a few days you know as as a control their, their ovulation is roughly around the same time of every month or their period is roughly around the same time of every month. And there are different other aspects that tie into it. Like, you know, other women who might be listening to this might say, well, what about when I sync up with my friends? Yeah, what about when you sync up with your friends? Sync, the term, the, 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 the key word here is sync. You're syncing up your period cycle with somebody. How would you be able to do that if there wasn't some kind of invisible, you know, uh, super as, as of now, unexplained force. Unexplained superstitious force. Well, it's it that's that's crap. It's crap. There's science. There's real legitimate science here that we can bring to you. We can actually get into that. Uh, some of it right now. I mean, there are the the CIA document that I declassified earlier in this podcast. The one that you can look up and find for yourself. The one that was declassified in 2003 that they were studying in the 1980s. Project Gateway? Project Gateway discusses kundalini energy. Now, kundalini is an old Sanskrit word. Uh, it's a concept that the Hindu and the Indian people of today are very, very big on. And it's basically the physical manifestation of energy within the body. And most of which is through meditation, yoga, and um, you know positive spiritual practices. Now, what what is what the fuck does that mean? What the hell does that have to do with anything? Well, it, can it be proven in science? That's another great question. Uh, there was a man in the 1940s named Wilhelm Reich. He was brought over from Germany after World War II in the uh, very famous Operation Paperclip, which if you don't know, um, it, Operation Paperclip. If you, don't, if you don't know, the U.S. government decided, hey, you know all those Nazi scientists that we said were the most evil scum on the face of the planet? We want them. We're not going to try any of them for anything that they did. Instead, we're going to hire all of them, and then we're going to put one of the top Nazi scientists, uh, Warner Von Braun, in charge of the entire NASA program. Right. So... <clears throat> You had all of these incredibly gifted Nazi scientists, and, and and not saying anything positive about the Nazis. I'm saying specifically about the scientists involved. The government did not try these people, as Richard said. Some of these men who were brought over performed disgusting acts, crimes against humanity, against groups of people. Disgusting acts. They were experimenting on human lives. But we brought them over anyway, and we decided to keep them and not try them. One of these men was known as Wilhelm Reich. You can look at him up if you'd like. He discovered what he coined as organ energy. It's a physical, it's, it's, it's an actual physical part of your body. Um, scientifically speaking, uh, after Richard and I looked into it a little bit deeper, um, what he was basically talking to what, what we were basically talking about was the vibrational frequency that your body resonates with in order to sustain itself. For example, your heartbeat. That's a physical proof that your body has to have some kind of electronic input, pulse, within your body. And scientifically speaking, what happens is the brain tells the thymus gland to tell the heart to tell the... Actually, specifically, the brain tells the thymus gland to tell the SA node attached to the heart to pump. 
And that that first bump out of the bump, which is your heartbeat, is that electronic pulse. The secondary electronic pulse is after your heart uh, flexes the blood, and then it sends it back up to the brain, telling it, "Yeah, we pumped." And that goes on in your body, uh, you know, thousands of times a day. Okay, but that heartbeat creates a vibrational frequency in correspondence with your brain, in correspondence with your thymus gland, in correspondence with your spleen as well. Your spleen is actually a very important organ in this entire aspect. You might think that the spleen is useless, but you'd be fucking wrong. All of these organs create a harmonious balance and blend of what, uh, uh, basically of like an electromagnetic sphere around your body. Now, here's the thing that might blow your fucking mind. Wilhelm Reich only put it on paper scientifically. That's all he did. He did not really necessarily discover this um, this is not some kind of concept where the scientific community was unaware of this, okay? This is something that the ancient people, Freemasons, Rosicrucians, um, Hermetists and Gnostics, uh, the, the Babylonians and the Chaldeans, they, the Egyptians were really big into this. They hypothesized and understood this concept. The Egyptians called it Atum, for example, or Adam. Sound familiar, right? So you have all these ancient cultures which have understood the very basic principle of we have some sort of invisible energy that we're able to produce. Uh, we understand it as heat on a physical level. If you touch somebody, you feel heat. No, it's a, it's, it's a form of very minor uh, radiation. If you've ever been sitting in a room and, you, and somebody you didn't like walked in the door and you got a really weird gut feeling like your stomach drops or if you've ever felt – um, you know, like you didn't want to be somewhere, uh, or you ever, or you ever had a bad feeling of something, you know, the, 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 the concept of understanding the feelings and emotions, it's not just on a chemical level. We're talking about frequency and vibrations, which are scientific concepts. And by the way, what happened to Wilhelm Reich? He was imprisoned under false claims. No claims and charges were put against him. And the, and then the FDA was responsible for burning and destroying all of his work, as well as executing him a couple of years after he was imprisoned. Okay, so you're talking about the FDA, which in my opinion is probably the most useless uh, a branch of our government because how many things do you consume, how many things do you eat or drink that have an FDA stamp of approval on them? Not many. And they basically you know, put this man in jail and, and murdered him for his, his work and his contributions to humanity. And what he discovered was there is an energetic basis within the human body. It does correspond with the spinal column. It does correspond with the brain. There are these things that we read. We have machines today that read temperature readings and different energy levels off of the human body. One of, one of, uh, one of the big um, selling points I, or, or whatever um, of uh, certain cults like Scientology are the thetan levels or whatever they're called, um, which are basically just forms of radiation off the body. It's, it's reading people's heat signatures. Okay, so you're talking about science. We're, we're, we're not talking about superstition here. It, it's time that we stop this bullshit. The same way that the planet has an electromagnetic sphere around itself, which causes it to protect us from the sun, we individually have one of these very minor um, uh, force fields, in, in a sense. And when you look at certain technologies, um, for example, MK Ultra, which was a which was a CIA operation to basically try to brainwash people with light and drugs. You have these instances where the government is involved and they're experimenting with human beings and their electromagnetic spheres to understand how they can influence and control people better. And is it is it any coincidence that? You know, decades after all of these studies are performed in the you know the sixty, the fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, and nineties of of the U.S. government and the governments of the U.N. Okay, is it is it any coincidence at all that as soon as all of those projects were over and the and the documents were declassified, that we started getting cheaper prices for televisions, or that we started seeing cell phones in everyone's hands tempered with glass and quartz? You need to understand another concept. Um, actually, there are a few scientific theories that have as much evidence backed as the gravitational, the universal gravitational law theory uh, that people don't understand. 
one of which is cosmic radiation theory. I'm sure we can come back to that one. But but it, but the one that I want to focus on, the electromagnetic or plasma universe theory. These are theories that are heavily rooted in scientific evidence that the scientific community just completely ignores. Um, there, are, there are works done for, for many, many years by scientists who are completely ignored and shoved under the rug. And yet they'll wait until these people die, like Nikola Tesla is a great example. They'll wait until these people die, they'll take the documentation, and then they'll start running experiments for themselves to test to see if it's accurate. And the, and the public will, will be none the wiser. They don't know any of this. So you have these different forms of high-level government and influences trying to perform experiments based off of science that the, the public's just not even aware of. So... It's just it's just super interesting to see that we live in a society right now where we're using theories that were come up with from people of antiquity thousands upon thousands of years ago and their basic level of understanding like, huh, sunlight, you know, the, the, the power from the sun actually gives us life. The power from the sun actually gives us life. You know, that's crazy. The moon actually controls the tides. That's crazy. You know, these, are, these things are crazy. How does it affect human beings? Is it any wonder to know, you know, is it any wonder that we see cell phones in the hands of every single individual and the concept of piezoelectricity is still accurate? Basically, there's a, there's a scientific property called piezoelectricity, which says that as atoms are crushed together into tighter elements, such as metals or crystals, they hold energy a lot better than things that are um, looser in their atomic structure. So okay. mechanical stress will produce an electrical charge. Right. So, and it's, there's even crystals in your brain that have this property, funny enough. Many of which are made of manganese. And, and also the DNA structure, according to Jeremy Narmi, who wrote a book called The Cosmic Serpent, the DNA structure has two strands that intertwine and then a middle strand of proteins. But that middle strand of proteins is basically quartz-like in structure. It's basically got the same uh, elemental com uh, composite construction, uh, um, uh, structure of quartz, which is a crystal. Why is this important? Because DNA is able to not only store information, but also send information like a signal. And then it's also funny that quartz to this day is still very commonly used in electronic pieces. TVs, computer, cell computer phones, chips, computers. All this sort of stuff. And on top of that, it's also the most common mineral type in the world. Yes. So, so there's so there's numerous types of stones and crystals out there that if you read into it is actually just another form of quartz. Right. And now, and now we get into the concept of jewelry. Why, why do people like jewelry? Why, is, why are rocks so expensive? They're just rocks. Because they're not fucking just rocks, people. Wake the fuck up. There's a whole entire market for Moldavite and Amethyst. And you got billionaires and millionaires paying thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars for gemstones that they believe are going to give them great luck or fortune or power. And you can, you can ascribe to it superstition or... The rarity of the stones, or whatever, the, but you're not paying attention if you yeah, do that. The, the, or you could, you could even chalk it up to these stones are so valuable because people think they're so valuable. And it's like, yes, but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself the question. You really have to answer, okay, but why? But why? Yeah. Even something is even with gold. Even with gold, it's still the gold question. standard. Our entire economy is based off of the gold standard, is it it's not? Like what I mean, is so what is so innately valuable about gold itself? Right. And the answer is there's nothing. really truly very little, but yet we choose it as such an important thing. And the question is, why? And the follow-up question is, could it be possible that there are properties to these things that we don't fully understand that give them, that, that encourage us to value them instinctively or to such, or, or, or reflexively, and then we try to explain it by talking about how pretty it is or how rare it is or we put value something, into it. Something on a very – value into it. Yeah, something very physical. Something, something that, that – really explain it. it. It's something that's just based off of our senses. But if you haven't been paying attention, what we're trying to convey to you is that there are things that are beyond our senses. 
that we interact with every day. You want to know a perfect example? Wi-Fi, 5G technology, cell phone towers. These are things you cannot feel, see, taste, touch, or smell, and yet you know they're real. You're being bombarded by electromagnetic waves every single day. Constantly, all the time. You know they're real. You know it exists because you take advantage of it every fucking day. And yet, you might be the type of person who sits there and says, no, it's not real. Crystals and metals, they don't hold you know, value, even though women and men in their own you know, separate instances are completely fucking enthralled with them. Men, especially in modern America, like, they like cars, they like computers, they like video games, they like technology, which is filled with metals and quartz crystals. Women like jewelry. And, uh, and I'm, of course, I'm stereotyping here. Not all of them. Not everybody's going to like this stuff. But women, generally speaking, like jewelry. They like necklaces and, and, and rings and different types of shiny stones. And, and there's a market for making fake ones. And there are women who are very astringent on having real ones. Why the fuck would that be? Why would it be that women want a diamond ring when they're getting engaged to? Why can't I just get them a McDonald's Big Mac? Okay, why can't I just buy her, buy her a fucking cheeseburger? Or at the very least, if she wants something that's going to last a long time, I'll buy her a picture. You know? Why is it that I have to spend thousands of dollars if I want to get engaged to a woman? I'm not, I'm not venting, by the way. Uh, I'm just saying in general, why is that? Because these things have different values. For example, diamond rings, they believe. Diamonds are able to hold energy because they're so tightly knit. They're, 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 they're some of the highest compact carbon. They believe t diamonds hold energy, electricity, uh, better than other elements. So when you put a diamond ring on a woman's finger, it is supposed to represent the long-lasting, uh, nurtured, and you know, uh, deeply held love energy of the relationship. That's actually what diamond rings were originally constructed to be. In the you know, even though it's fucking Hallmark shit. Even though birthstones, based off of the month you were born, most of which is just Hallmark crap. And the jewelry, the jewelry industry has changed it at least a few times. Right. The, the whole point being, there's still some semblance of truth and reality in the fact that people, especially the wealthy, especially the rich, see a positive net result from hoarding crystals and metals. This is why people used to hoard gold. There's something about it. There's something deeply innate within it. And what we're trying to explain to you is the scientific properties of such a thing. Now, all that being said, um, what does this have to do with religion and secrets? Well, secret societies, um, and there have been many throughout the years, secret societies in general uh, have been... A major point in human history. Okay, you have Freemasons, Rosicrucians. Um, you have ancient societies that go back, uh, you know, to to before the Chaldeans even, which are you know six thousand years ago, um, before the flood of Noah and the Epic of Gilgamesh, which are the same story essentially. Um, before all that, there there have been members of antiquity which have come together who believe, basically believe they were special in the same arrogant way that the scientists believe that they're special today. Members of antiquity, which would come together as conglomerates um, of both men and women, it, it wasn't just a men thing, and they would discuss different ways in which they could, uh, you know, some, some of which wanted to help humanity, some of which wanted to control humanity. And that's the basis of it. And what we're seeing now um, is an uncovering of that, or as the, m the members of antiquity who discussed the book of revelations and discussed the apocalypse and the end of the world not necessarily the destruction of the planet earth but more so the destruction of what the human society saw as reality we're seeing the uncovering of that the veil of isis being lifted as they would describe Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this little podcast segment, make sure you like and subscribe. Comment on the video your thoughts or anything that you want to say or add to it. And make sure you also check out our Patreon uh, as well. We have a lot of nice things coming out. Um, specifically, we're working on a book uh, right now. And um, make sure you check us out uh, on our shop when that comes out. We're going to have a bunch of nice merchandise. And um, support us. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter.
and let us know what subjects you guys are interested in, in yep. it, whatever it is. Let us know what you would like to hear us talk about, or what you wanna, or what you what you talk about, and what you think is important. Just, just whatever. Yep. Let us know down below. Thanks, guys. We love you. Love you. Take care.